I really never had anyone in front of my camera that I thought was more adept at that specific thing that is video performance, uh, which is different than acting, it's different than something you would do on a stage, um, it's knowing how to make a graphic idea, it's knowing how to turn on the charisma for the camera, it's even down to knowing lenses, lens sizes, and how to work the light, but in ways that create iconic moments. In a video you're trying to create iconography, flashes of iconic graphic imagery that has a kineticism to it and an energy to it, and she does it better than anyone I've ever worked with. One of the things I wanted to do with No Doubt is I wanted to just something as simple as make a gritty looking black and white video because when you think of No Doubt you think of vibrant vivid colors. I just thought let's make a little left turn here and do something that looks a little different. I remembered seeing a photo essay in um, some European fashion magazine and I remember there was this quality of like punk, glamour, and it was all set in a kind of aquatic world. I was thinking of it almost like an, an early 80s punk documentary where the, the streets and the city, instead of buildings and pavement and asphalt, it was going to be water and cargo ships. We scouted the San Pedro Harbor, Los Angeles, the port of Los Angeles basically, and it, and it looked great and I'd never really seen anyone shoot a music video there before. This is Mark Romanek. I want to talk about this Mick Jagger video which I really liked the song and I didn't particularly have any ideas for. And I remember I was flipping through a magazine and I saw strangely enough a fashion shoot that showed a male model, a very muscular guy, with a body camera rig strapped to his body. And when I saw that and I was listening to the song I said you know, I've seen that shot a million times of the camera attached to the body. And it occurred to me that if you took a trick like that, but you made it wall to wall, and every single shot in the video was a body camera rig, then it would maybe just cumulatively be really impressive. And, you know, Mick Jagger is such a physical performer, and the idea that the actual video would be driven by him physically, that was really exciting to me. Normally when you see those shots in movies, they're just sort of head and shoulder shots because the camera needs to be attached tightly to the body and you can't really arm out too far away from the body. But I said, I want to get a wider shot. Let's figure out how we can actually get the camera away from the performer. And that started you know, a really lengthy process of designing and building a custom body rig and it was extremely awkward and I deliberately put them in very tight spaces like a record store and a video arcade and so getting used to maneuvering this incredibly awkward thing was um, a real challenge. Mick didn't like it at first because it, he felt just very restricted but I said you know what like if you smash the camera and break it we've got three of them don't worry they're cheap cameras I didn't really care I didn't want them to be careful so when Mick finally did a take where he really just spun around and I do think he banged the camera a couple times. I showed him the playback, and at that point he said, yeah, that does look really cool, and now I see how to play with it, and if I swivel my hips, the camera will tilt. And He still didn't love it, but I think he realized that it was sort of worth the work. It was definitely more collaborative in a good way working with Madonna. Some artists know that they don't necessarily have a knack for filmmaking or a sense of imagery or filmmaking and they let you just do it. Other people are literally too busy and they just really, they may know a lot about it or have opinions about it, but they have so much going on they'd rather just say, it's your job to take care of this and I trust you. It was more collaborative in the sense that she had many opinions about elements of the video and what she liked and didn't like. She was more involved in the editing. She would come into the editing room and look at a cut and she would say, you know, I think this would be better over here, and this seems too slow here, and we would go, she's right, and we would change it. So she has a great uh, sensitivity to filmmaking. It's hard to come up with a simple idea, you know? It's just the band is floating. A lot of times, and this is, I think, kind of conventional thinking, but for a first video, the label will say, well, we want to show them as a band, because nobody knows them yet, so we don't want to be too conceptual, we just want to see them as a band. And you know, it's kind of the last thing that a video director wants to hear because you just don't want to shoot a band performing. It's just, it creates a situation that makes it much harder to do something original. 
So I said, well, how can I show them as a band but put a twist on it? And I don't know why this popped into my head, but I just got this idea of what if the music sort of lifted them off the ground and they were playing like a band, but they were just sort of floating around in free gravity. And I really, I don't know where that came from other than the fact that I really loved the movie Mary Poppins when I was a kid. And I seem to recall a lot of 2001 A Space Odyssey and Mary Poppins. There seem to be a lot of people floating around in movies. You know, I have a, I guess I have a tendency, and I think there's a theme throughout some of the other commentaries on this DVD. Of, I, I think I really torture people. I think I put people really through hell to make these videos, but, you know, I guess I want them to be really good, and to do something really good usually requires this extra effort. During the shoot, they're like, man, this guy is a real hard ass, but I don't have a, you know, I'm friends with most of the people I've made the videos with, and I think once they've seen the video, they, they go, oh, wow, this came out really good. And, I think some people approach videos like, well, we're just going to have a good time. And sometimes a good video could emerge from that. But most of the time, it's like, it's just really hard work to try to do something that's better than everything else you see. And it's more hours, and it's more takes, and it's more of an effort. And so I, I think people think, wow, this guy is really a hard ass. But, you know, I don't know. <laughs> You know, if I get an idea for a music video that's just sort of free-floating, that's not necessarily connected to a job, I'll just write it down or stick it in a folder in my computer. And One of them was that I really liked the last shot of Truffaut's 400 Blows. And the last shot is of this little boy uh, running towards the shore, and it freezes and then zooms in on the frozen frame. When I sat down with Beck, he said, do you know the last shot of the 400 Blows? And I said, yeah, I love that. Why do you mention? He said, wouldn't that be a cool effect to use in a music video? And I, and I said, that's really weird that you say that because I've, I've always thought that. So we started talking about how do we build a video around that concept. We shot it all on a kind of outdated film stock because uh, when it froze and zoomed in, I wanted to really see real film grain. And all the zooms and the freezes, we didn't do that digitally in a computer. We, we went to you know, an old optical printing house. Once again, it was a situation of like, what was I being, what was I into at that time? And I was really into this work, this photography by Malik Sidibe and another photographer, Faisal Sheikh, I think his name is, African photographers, portrait photographers. In terms of the initial approach to Janet about this, I brought her a bunch of photograph books of photography in this book on Drum Magazine. And I said, I know this is going to seem kind of left field, but this is the world I want to drop you into for this song. And I, she got it. You know, I didn't have to try to articulate why this felt right. It just felt right to her. And she understood this connection of making an Afrocentric video, but in this unexpected way. She said, wow, I like this. For some reason, I... Because I think because the, the Joni Mitchell sample is from about 1971 and a lot of this photography was from the early 70s, I, I put those two things together. But more importantly, actually, I think without sounding self-righteous, I was really getting pissed off by the kind of videos that I was seeing. And this is going to sound like a really pretentious thing to say, but I felt like black culture was representing itself in a really narrow way. It's ridiculous for a white boy to look at that and say, well, maybe I can do something about that, but that's kind of what happened. And I said, you know, I would like to make a video that depicted black culture that wasn't African-American culture, but it was African culture, and it wasn't so obsessed as a lot of the hip hop videos were in that period and still are with less materialism and sexism. I just felt like there's got to be other aspects of black culture to depict. And that was sort of the manifesto I made for myself. As a filmmaking challenge, as a technical filmmaking challenge, I wanted to recreate a, a world that was a period world that's really exotic and alien to me, certainly, in Los Angeles on film as, as artifice, as like how authentic can you make this by just the craft of filmmaking and production design and wardrobe and makeup and casting. And to this day, uh, much to my pleasure, I have people say, where did you shoot that video? Did you, did you go to South Africa or did you go to West, West Africa? Or 
where did you go to shoot that? And I said, mm, we shot it on the corner of Sunset and Gower. The casting director was a woman named Risa Barish. It's really the casting, among other things. The set that Virginia Lee designed is stunning. And the clothes that Kim Bowen and David Bradshaw designed are stunning. And Jeff Cronin with cinematography is beautiful. But it's the casting that's really astonishing. The central gimmick of the video was that the camera would disappear into black voids and in each of those voids Keith would emerge in this sort of spectral way. So that was kind of a motif that ran throughout all this sort of Ouija-esque imagery. So I just tried to think of a lot of holes and orifices that the camera could disappear into like open manhole covers and uh, vents and broken television sets and things. That, that was obviously the exception to the lighting idea, and there were other exceptions. Some of the interiors we lit with practical lights, but we had a very hard light right in front of Keith's nose, and I just had him sort of lean into it and lean back out into the darkness. And It was a little awkward for the first few seconds, and then he really got the hang of it. And he started to really work with it in a, in a pretty intuitive way.